Is that called Judges chapter number 6? And uh, enjoyed uh, the passage this morning. I'm looking forward to the next few weeks. Uh, but wanted to finish out uh, where we were uh, this morning and uh, just kind of talking about Gideon, the uh, reluctant judge there. And uh, we had gotten down and uh, we're looking at verse number uh, 20, uh, 24 there. And we were talking about uh, the, uh, the uh, situation there with Gideon uh, asking for a sign and things like that. And before I jump into uh, our text tonight, which we'll begin reading in verse 25, I wanted to say this. I don't, I don't believe anything was wrong with uh, Gideon asking for a sign, asking for confirmation of what, uh, what he was to do there. Uh, however, uh, I will say this. There are things uh, in God's word that we don't need confirmation of. All right. And what I mean there is there are things clearly outlined in Scripture uh, that when God says do it, uh, we don't have to say, are you sure we're to do it? Amen. Yeah, amen. Uh, we don't need to put out a fleece uh, for the fact of are we supposed to go to church today? Uh, well, no, the Bible tells us that we're to assemble together. You, don't, you can go ahead and roll your fleece back up, uh, stick it back inside. You don't have to fix a kid and the ephah uh, there of barley. You can just go to church because that's what God would have you do, right? Uh, do I need to love my neighbor right now? Uh, check yes or no, God, right? No, no, no. The Bible tells us clearly we're to love our neighbor. There are things that are clearly outlined, clearly defined in Scripture uh, that we don't need confirmation of, all right? God's Word uh, is confirmation enough, but there are times uh, where God will put something on your heart, say, I want you to uh, do this. This is, uh, 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 in, it is beyond normal. It is a different kind of scenario. And I believe that it's a very healthy thing uh, that we ask God to confirm that. I believe we ask him uh, to, to open doors, to close doors. Uh, I view much of life this way. If the door appears to be open and it appears to be in line uh, with principles within God's word, counsel uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, lead me elsewise, I'm going to pursue that. But if the door starts closing, I'm going to hesitate. I'm going to stop uh, because there's a reason that door is closing. You understand what I'm saying there? And uh, that doesn't mean that uh, when the devil fights, we back off. But it does mean there are times in life where God does close doors. And uh, we would be wise to not try to barge through an open one. Amen? And so uh, with that said, I want you to understand uh, there are uh, certain things that we don't need to uh, test God on. We don't need to uh, put out that fleece. There are things that are specifically detailed uh, to, in, in the Word of God. We're to obey those things. And uh, I believe we'd be none the wiser for that. Begin reading in verse 25 tonight. And uh, we'll read down through verse number 32. Uh, chapter number uh, 6 of Judges, and uh, let's begin reading at verse 25. Matter of fact, let's do this. Let's read together. Uh, I don't see any massive words. I think we can do it. Uh, verse 25, everybody there? I'll wait for everybody to get there, or you can look on the screen there. I really just wanted to take a drink. All right, verse 25. You ready? Here we go. And it came to pass the same night, and the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. Now I'm going to pause for a moment and let everybody that wasn't reading together jump in here on verse 26. You ready? Here we go. And build an altar, there we go, unto the Lord thy God, upon the top of this rock, in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants, and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? When they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, had done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, because he cut down the grove that was by him. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will you plead for Baal? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. 
If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore, on that day he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you for your word, and I ask that you be with us tonight as we take a look at it. I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would help us to understand what you can do uh, with even a little faith, a hesitant servant. And Father, I pray that you'd speak uh, to us. I pray that you'd speak through me. Help me to say nothing that I shouldn't, everything that you'd have me to say. I pray that your word not return void and that your spirit would do everything in our hearts that you'd want it to. I pray that we would uh, seek to be more like you. I pray that uh, we would be desirous of uh, change and refining and sharpening. And God, that you would be able to uh, use us, that we be vessels meet for your use. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness. I pray that you be with the teenagers tonight. And I uh, pray that you be with us here in a few moments as we go to prayer. We thank you so much for the chance to pray. Thank you so much for Christ and the access that we have to you through him. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's look at this situation. I want you to see, uh, first of all, uh, the opportunity that God lays before Gideon. Verse number 25 came to pass the same night. What night is this? This is the night uh, that Gideon has tested God. He has uh, asked for a sign. God has confirmed that. And it, the Bible says it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven uh, years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. Build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. So God comes to him. He says, Hey, listen, you're... Uh, your family, your city, your people have been uh, worshiping Baal. I want you to notice uh, whose altar of Baal this is. Look at verse 25. Somebody tell me whose altar of Baal this is. His own father's. Joash, his daddy, has an altar of Baal. When we're talking about the grove there... The grove that is by it, we're not talking about a grove of orange trees sitting behind the altar. A grove there, the word in the Hebrew is the word uh, Asherah. It is uh, uh, talking about the Phoenician goddess Astarte. Um, so we've got the altar to Baal, and we've actually got an idol. We've got an image of a Phoenician goddess uh, right there beside the altar. What are you saying? I'm saying they're pretty far gone. Yeah. Right. They're pretty far gone. I, I'm saying this is... His own father, this is his household, and they have departed from what is right, and they are worshiping that which uh, they should not. And God comes to him, and God tells him, hey, listen, I want you to go to the altar that your dad has. I want you to tear it down. I want you to tear down the other uh, idol that's sitting behind it, and then I want you, on top of it, uh, to build an altar on top of the rock. I want you to take your dad's bull and I want you to sacrifice it on this altar as a burnt sacrifice. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to use that idol that you tore down. I want you to use that to stoke the fire. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying here? Now, how many of you know that you're to respect your father? Okay. How many of you, your dad has something that you are not to touch? When you're growing up, you have certain items that you shouldn't mess with, right? Now imagine, God's, God tells him, go to your daddy's uh, place of worship, take the God that he serves, hack it into pieces, and burn his own bull on that altar. You follow what I'm saying? Some of us struggle with serving God and struggle with the things that God uh, puts into our path. Because we think to ourselves, well, that's a daunting task, right? Man, talking to my relative, talking to my mom, talking to my dad about salvation, it is just an uncomfortable thing. Are you with me? Right. Think about what he's being told to do right now. Now, give it. Now, listen to me. You say, well, it's his dad. His dad will be forgiving. Well, understand that those in this community, they're worshiping, they're worshiping the same God, right? We're not talking about just a one-off 
uh, uh, idol worshiper among the Israelites. I mean, they are given to this. This is uh, the, the, the pressure around them. This is the accepting worship around them. And God says, hey, I want you to uh, go. I want you to tear it down. And then I want you to worship God in this place. You see the opportunity there? Look at it. Gideon's obedience. Look what happens in verse 27. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because, look what it says, he what feared his father's household and who? The men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Gideon liked the courage to do it in the daytime. And so he went and did it at night. But, but can I say this before we're hard on Gideon here? Can I say it is better to timidly obey the Lord than to not obey Him at all? That's good. It is better to timidly obey God than to not obey Him at all. And all throughout Gideon that we've seen so far, we've seen a timid, a reluctant man of God, have we not? Right. And this falls directly in line with the man that he is. But step by step, we're seeing over and over in this story that albeit he may be reluctant and he may be hesitant, he may have some excuses and he may not be a big fan of it. We see over and over that he's taking little uh, baby steps of faith and timid and reluctant as they may be. God is rewarding them because they're steps. Amen. Right. Oftentimes in our life, we're so scared of the unknown. We're scared of uh, what God calls us to do. We're scared of uh, the uncomfortable positions that the Spirit of God's going to put us in. And so we say, listen, it's a great idea, but I just can't get my feet wet. I'm just, I'm just not going to take that step because I know, I know, and, and, and by the way, God wants a whole heart, and I can't do this wholeheartedly, so I'm just going to sit back out on this one. You follow what I'm saying? Hey, listen to me. Obedience, obedience, obedience. Amen. By the way, let me just say this. Availability is the best ability. Yes. Availability is the best ability. You say, well, I'm not the smartest. I'm not the sharpest. I'm not the most eloquent. Listen to me. Moses said it. Gideon says it in this passage. It doesn't matter your stock, your heritage, uh, where you came from, where you've been, what you've done. The best ability is availability. What are you saying? I'm saying get off the sidelines and get in the game. God can do something with somebody who's surrendered to His will. Amen. There's something in your life possibly that God's been saying, Hey, listen, I, I want you to step out by faith. I want you to uh, try me here. I want you to prove me here. I want you, and, and you say, but I'm, I'm scared. Everybody's scared. Amen? Right. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure what will happen. Uh, we have no promises. We don't know. I, 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 stop making excuses. Take a step of faith and watch what God does. And some of you, you live beside a neighbor and you're thinking to yourself, man, they desperately need Jesus. I really hope a pastor comes to my house and meets my neighbor. Why don't you go talk to your neighbor about Jesus? Yeah, amen. You say, well, what if they ask me a question that I don't know? Well, then come ask me and I won't know either and we'll Google it online. Yeah. <laughs> it, l listen, try. Step out. Obey. Uh, God's asking me to do a big thing. Okay, He's able to accomplish it. We've got, a, we've got some decisions to make here in the future. It looks like God uh, may be closing some doors, opening some doors as far as the building and things like that. To be honest, I'm getting more and more uncomfortable by the day. But I know this. I know if God uh, puts something in our path, he, he, he is going to give us the strength and the ability to do it. And I know that God's plan is perfect and God's ways are best. And if he's closing one door, that means he's going to open another one. Amen? That's good. We're going to obey. We're going to step through. And we're going to watch God do big things. Uh, you, you say, well, I want an easy road. I, I tell you this. I, I am to the point in my life, I don't want an easy road. I want a hard road that God's on. That's good. I want to see God do big things. The truth of the matter is we can barge through life and do whatever it is that we want to do. Uh, but if we're not doing it under the power of God, we're wasting our life. Step out by faith. Obey God when He calls. You say, well, I just got a little faith. Use your little faith and watch your big God. It's better to timidly obey God than not obey Him at all. I want you to see the opposition He encounters. We've seen the opportunity. We see His obedience. We see the opposition. Listen, with opportunity and obedience, there's almost certainly going to come opposition. 
Verse number 28, when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down. And the grove was cut down, uh, was cut down that was by it. The second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said to one another, who hath done this thing? Uh, let's pause for a moment because I want you to understand this. The altar may have been on his daddy's property, but I believe the men of the city were used to using it. And he shook some feathers here. I mean, he messed some things up. And he said, who has done this thing? They inquired and asked and said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. The men of the city said unto Joash, bring out thy son that he may die. Let's kill him. He has torn down the altar of Baal because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. Uh, let me just say this. This is how powerful Baal worship had become at that time. The heresy that they accepted had become their main religion. Right. They didn't want an altar to Jehovah God. They wanted to worship uh, their God, their Phoenician goddess of fertility. They wanted to worship Baal, the Baal. By the way, that had never answered one of their prayers. Right. Let's just go here. Let's talk about this. He never answered one of their prayers. He had never done anything for them. He never parted the seas. He never delivered them from bondage. And yet over and over and over they worshipped him because they saw something tangibly and it was easier. And they were led aside because it felt good uh, to worship this God. Understand he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. And yet they worship him. What, what, what are you saying? I'm saying, listen, just because it's popular and accepted doesn't make it right. That's right. right. The heresy had become accepted, had become a, a mainstay. You say, well, why would they worship Baal in the first place? They believed that he was the god of weather. And they relied on weather for agricultural prosperity. And, and in the hard economic times they were experiencing, uh, they, they had, uh, because of the Midianite oppression, they began to worship Baal all the more. And, and listen to me, every bit of prosperity they had was because of God. Right. And they attributed the works of God to this false God, this, this false idol. Uh, what are you saying? I'm saying this. When God does something in your life, don't you dare take credit for it. And don't you dare give credit to something else for it. Right. Everything you are, everything you have, everything you uh, will be and can be is because of the goodness of God. Amen. And Gideon here, although he has a little faith, he says... I'm going to do this. They said, well, we're going to kill him. And then uh, notice his dad's response. Joash's uh, obligation here in verse 31. Joash said unto all them that stood against him, Will you plead for Baal? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself. Because one hath cast down his altar. Now, I want you to think about this. We see that Gideon's story goes on in the next couple chapters. What does that tell me? That Baal was not a god. That Baal could not do anything to Gideon. Why? Because he wasn't alive. Well, how, how, how did they find out Gideon's obedience? Gideon's obedience. I believe as we'll see in the next coming chapters over the next few weeks, we'll see Gideon accomplish some great things. And by the way, it's still with a little bit of faith. It's still with a little bit of faith, but he accomplishes some great things. But what, here's what it does. Here's what it does. It shows the other children of Israel this. That what they are worshiping is not worth worshiping. And they see, they see the God of Gideon... Do some incredible things. Why? Because one man had a little bit of timid faith. So what did we take from that? Brother Keith, go ahead and start coming up here. What do we take from that? Obey God when he calls. Give him whatever you can. 
You say, I have doubt, I have fear, so did he. But watch what God does when you just make yourself obedient and available. Yeah. I don't know what it is in your life that God wants you to do. I'm not going to stand here and say God has told me to tell you to do this. I, I don't know what your, uh, what your altar that you need to tear down is. I don't know what stand you need to take. But here's what I know. The God of Gideon is the God of Samantha and the God of Jeff and Dan and Ashley and Kayla and everybody else in this room. Man. Same God, same power, yes. same ability, and we ought to have the same obedience. Amen. God, we love you, we thank you, we praise you for your goodness. Pray that you be with us in this prayer time tonight. I thank you for the stories, the examples that we see in your word. We thank you for who you are, for your strength, your power, uh, most of all for your love. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us Jesus. Thank you for giving us hope. And Father, I pray that you use us for your glory. I pray this church would be filled with people uh, of obedience. And while it may be little faith, I pray that you'd help us to be people of faith and that we display faith and that we please you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Keith.